Welcome to the 2021 Isla Family Speaker Series. My name is Dr. Noralis Rodriguez Cos, and it is an honor to be your host uh, for this presentation today. Uh, as, a for, as a Puerto Rican feminist scholar who is a guest in the, in the place where this presentation is physically hosted, Spokane, Washington, I want to begin this event by recognizing the traditional homelands uh, of the Spokane, Coeur d'Alene, and Kalispell Indigenous people who are connected through their shared history of this region. For those of you that are joining this series for the first time, this is a space of scholars and activists working in island and feminist studies to spark collaboration and interdisciplinary dialogue on social justice for islands and islanders. I want to also thank our attendees that are connected from different parts of the world and those who are contributing uh, to this event, including our program assistants, Amity Maloy and Carla Peña, our session sponsor, uh, the Department of Women's and Gender Studies from Gonzaga University, and our speakers who I will introduce now. But I also want to recognize Marina Carides that is here and also co-convener of the speaker series. So uh, our speakers, Dr. Hun uh, Justina Taft Matos, teaches for the Performing Arts Department at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. Uh, Matos was raised in Hawaii and is an alumna of the University of Hawaii at Hilo where her studies focus on theater arts as well as Hawaiian language and culture. She earned her PhD in theater history and criticism from the, uh, from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, where her research focused on the history and development of Hawaii's local theater tradition. While theater about life and in Hawaii is uh, her passion, since her return to Hawaii Island, uh, she has been commissioned to direct plays by both local and non-local playwrights for several theaters of the island. Matos directs in both traditional theater settings and less traditional formats using community actors to develop live and videotape dramatic vignettes and presentations for organizations such as Imiloa Astronomy Center and the U.S. Hilo College of Pharmacy. She has also helped to found the Kiaka uh, Hawaiian Language Theater Festival. Desire Moana Cruz is our next speaker, uh, or also joining by right? Destina Matos. Uh, Desire has traveled uh, the world over as a hula dancer, performing in far flung destinations as Tahiti, Jakarta, Mos Moscow, Baghdad, Cairo, London, and more. Cruz is the director of Small Talent Agency and an advocate of, for Hawaiian practitioners in arts and entertainment. She earned a degree in liberal arts and Hawaiian studies from the University of Hawaii. Um, a Hilo resident for 30 years, Desire is an active community member serving on several boards. During the pandemic, she has enjoyed writing her memoirs, Pepper, with favorite recipes. Uh, the format today, uh, before we begin, right, uh, I want to emphasize that this presentation is being recorded and it will be archived in our website for the public to watch as use uh, and use for educational resources. Uh, our presentation today has a different format to previous presentations. It is a theater play divided into acts. Today we will have uh, act number one and right after at number one, we will have a brief question and answer session with Matos and Cruz, who played uh, and Cruz, who played who uh, the role of Ka Humano. Uh, the second part of this presentation is on March 12th, and for that occasion, we will have played by Victoria Nalani Kehembu, uh, with with a more extended discussion after Act Two. Uh, our program assistant Amity will keep attendees muted, but please feel free to write questions in the chat uh, that you can find on the menu. And Maloy will connect those questions uh, to be answered by the speakers during the Q&A section. Okay, thank you so much. And Justina, uh, it's, uh, you can share the screen if, if you want. Yes. Okay. Um, before I start the video, I just want to introduce the play to you a little bit. 
The conversion of Kaahumanu tells the story of a Hawaiian queen at the locus of change during a time of catastrophic loss for her people. It was written by Victoria Nalani Newbel and first produced by Honolulu's Kumu Theater in 1988. It has since then been uh, on stage across the United States as well as going on tour to Edinburgh, Scotland. And um, the play has five characters, Queen Ka'ahumanu, which as um, Norales said, is played by Desiree Moana Cruz in our production. Pali and Hana, her two ladies in waiting, and Sybil and Lucy, who are the two American Calvist, Calvinist missionary wives who seek her out. So five women. The play was initially criticized for having only female characters. The Honolulu Advertiser's drama critic defined it as a woman's play that contained only female characters who could react to outside events, but never place them in, in motion. In actual fact, though, Ka'ohumanu's decision on whether or not to convert to Christianity has had an incredible impact on Hawaii's history that continues to have ramifications today. The production you're about to watch was supposed to be presented at the University of Hawaii at Hilo last spring, 2020, which would have marked the 200th anniversary of the first arrival of American missionaries in Hawaii. Um, due to COVID, our production was shut down two weeks before we opened. And so in a desperate effort to salvage what we could, we pulled together some costumes really quick, put some furniture on the stage and videotaped the production. So what you're going to see is an early rehearsal. The actresses rallied together and put on an opening night worthy uh, performance. Um, so the, the sound may be a little echoey, just bear that in mind as, as you hear it. So I'm going to share my screen now. I don't, oh, there we go. All right, can you all see this? Hello? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes, we can see it. Okay, good. I'm going to start it now. In 1815, I, Sybil Mosley, felt the calling of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I confessed my faith before the congregation and now cling to the bosom of the church. Though I am a sinner, I now have hope that God will call me his own and receive me at his right hand. In 1815, I, Lucy Goodell, was washed in the blood of our Lord Jesus. My family rejoiced in my pious calling. I do now truly trust and believe that dear Redeemer who tasted death for us all. In 1819, I am of low spirits. A kindred spirit to whom I am dearly attached has now departed from my life to serve God in another part of the world. I do not know where my life is going nor what the Lord would have me do. I feel many days of loneliness and sorrow. The joy I once felt at teaching these young girls slowly drains away, and I feel heavy with a weight I, I neither understand nor can overcome. I read of women who do mission work with the heathen peoples of the earth, and I envy them 
that they have a service and a purpose under God. I pray that I too may one day have such a purpose. In 1819, my mother died. My dear sister Persis was married and left our father's home. My mother gone, Persis gone. Wonder not when I say that I more than ever felt myself an orphan. My solitary chamber witnesses my grief as I walk from side to side. My pillow is watered with tears. I apply myself to the fountain of all grace and consolation for support. I yield myself up entirely to the will of the Holy One. My prayers were answered. Tomorrow I go to Goshen, Connecticut to meet one who may be of the same heart and mind as I, a young man about to embark on a life of mission work in the Sandwich Island seeks a companion for this noble cause. God will guide me. My cousin William visited me today. He gave me information that a mission to the Sandwich Islands was to sail in four to six weeks. He dwelt on it with interest and feeling. Imagine my surprise when he asked, will you, Lucy, by becoming connected with a missionary, now an entire stranger, attach yourself to this small band of pilgrims and bring the word of the gospel to a land of darkness? Now I feel the need of guidance. Oh, that my sister were here. On October 11th, 1819, I am joined in holy matrimony with the Reverend Hiram Bingham. On October 12th, 1819, I was joined in holy matrimony to the Reverend Asa Thurston. Thurston. On October 23rd, 1819, we set sail as members of a pioneer company of missionaries to the Sandwich Islands. Like Rebecca, we have said, I will go. Here is why I, Kahumanu, Kuhina Nui and widow of Kamehameha, have agreed with the other chiefs, the friends and counselors of Kamehameha, to do these things. Kamehameha unified these islands, he forged a great power. And it is we, his loyal Ali'i, we will be the keepers of that power. And we will no longer share this power with the priestly class. We do not need a kahuna to declare kapu or offer sacrifices. Hmm. And here's another thing. For many years now, we have seen these haole, these foreigners among us. We know that they break the kapu. Do the gods come to punish them? No. Women have gone to the ships and have eaten with these haole men. Do the gods come to punish them? No. So why should it be that they will come to punish us at all? I think these beliefs are nothing, false. And who is it who hates most this couple of eating? We, Ali'i women, and Keo Puolani, the highest of the couple chiefs, has spoken out in strength. We will no longer accept a lowly place anymore. And the men of the priesthood will see this. Ha! You should have seen their faces when we sat to eat. Have I ever made a great prayer to the gods? Liho Liho, the king, approached. He sat with us to eat. Many faces turned as white as a full moon. He ate, and the people waited, waited in silence. Silence for the great wrath of the gods, which never came. Then there arose a great outcry from the women, I know I know Now, the couple of the gods has ended. We enter now the time of the couple of the chiefs. What can I say to you? My sisters this morning, uh, I can tell you, if your eye could glance across the great water and catch this little bark ascending and descending, these mountainous waves which contain your dear sister, you would, your hands would involuntarily extend to her relief and your cry would be to save 
a majestic forest, the dashing of the waves on the deck, the frequent falling of something below, the, the violent motion of the vessel going up and then down would seem to, to terrify and distress. Yet, in my mind, I am calm. Is this not the mercy of God? Oh, oh Lucy, what are you doing out here? I felt so sick shut up in there. It is very rough. How long have we been at sea? About 60 days. And still not halfway there? Oh, oh Lucy, are you all right? I am frightened by the sea today. You are safe. What do you think will really happen to us, Sybil? I don't know, Lucy. You know, anything. Anything could happen out to us out here in the middle of the sea, in the middle of nowhere. No one would know and no one would care. Why did they come here? God called you. Oh, suppose they don't want us in their islands. You suppose they aren't friendly. The sailors say that they are no listen to what the sailors say. They hate this ocean. They hate this ship. Now we must lean on him. Give all your thoughts and all your fears to him. I am trying. Think of the poor heathens, Lucy, whose immortal souls languish in darkness. Who will give them the Bible or tell them Tell them of our Lord and Savior, if not us. Who think of the Hawaiians who will, who will have that grace because someone such as Lucy Thurston was willing to say, I will go. When they get drunk, they might come looking for me. I'm glad my father isn't a howling. Ha! You don't even know who your father is. I do so! Who then? Who? See? You don't know. Well, at least I'm not chased around by howling men. Because you aren't as pretty as me. No. It's because I'm not half a howling. I don't look like them. They're not so bad. It's only when they're sick with rum. Are howling men better than a kanaka? I don't know. I've never been with a Kanaka. Besides, my father would beat me until I couldn't walk. I'm Davis's woman now. Will you have another baby with him? Shut up, Polly. You're nothing but a chicken clucking gossip all over the village. Now tell me of this battle. No! You told me to shut up. You think I'm stupid? All right, I'm sorry. Now tell me. No! I'll give you this pretty ribbon. See how pretty it is? Everyone will envy you. What should I do with it? Tie up in your hair. Where did you get this? I have a lot of them. You're lucky. Now tell me. It's because of the free eating. The chief Kikuokulani and his followers don't like the way the chiefs are throwing aside the company. He will fight. My father said this would happen. What do you think of the company? Lies. How do you know? I know. I've heard the talk amongst the foreigners. There are no such beliefs in other places. And there's never any punishment? No, and be quiet. I told you, I don't want them to hear us. Well, why don't we spill? It's a fight over nothing. Everyone knows who will win. I don't care. My life won't change.
bring holy men. And how do women? And they say to bring a new God. Women? I. This is a new sight. Perhaps I will come to see them after I go fishing. You will come fishing with me? Well, if it is your wish. <laughs> no, I can see your mind is full of wonder about these holy women. Go and satisfy your longing. Oh, thank you, thank you. I will tell you everything that I see. Your men come for women? Oh, 
What do you want? Oh, we don't want anything like that. No. We bring the good news of, of Jesus Christ. <laughs> the news of Jesus Christ? Yes. Why should I wish to hear the news of someone I don't even know? Because he is God. He is the blessed son of God. We do God. not need a new God. We have enough of God. How? And the king has spoken of these things to the people. We will have no more gods. The gods brought only sorrow and unhappiness. We will not have that again. Let us speak of other things. Our God is different. He is the one who is Lucy. I want yellow clothes. I will send you yellow cloth. Yes, we will be happy to do this. And you must also come so we can measure you. Measure? So we can cut. Cut? To make your clothes. Hmm. Well, perhaps. And I will come. And you have a very kind face but very sad. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and when you come, perhaps we can talk a little more. Uh, oya papa. So that we may get to know each other's ways. Mali papa. Here we will begin God's work. Aloha. Aloha. Aloha, Avakea, Aloha, Awinala, Aloha, Ahi Ahi, Pahea Oi, Makai, Makai, Pahea Oi, Anu Maluhi Luhi Ao. But why do you think she likes me, Hana? I know she likes you because you're so pretty and smart. And because I know all of the gossip amongst the foreigners. But why should she pick me? I don't know. She just picks her favorites. Shall we look into the naked eye? Yes. They're always busy till their faces make water. Why do they do that? It's their way. Aloha, eh, Mrs. Singham? Oh, Mrs. Thurston. Good day, Anna. Good day. Where are you going? To the house of Kaha mm -hmm. Are you going to sail? A sail? Yes, like the sailors with the needle in and out. No, this is how we sew, how we make dresses. Are you making a dress? I would like to have a dress. No, Hana. She is just mending a tear in her apron. You tore your beautiful clothes? How? A fight in the village this morning. You got into a fight? Oh, no. She was helping someone. A man was being beaten for no reason that I could see. There's always fighting in the village. This man had funny markings on his forehead and around his eyes. A kowal. That's why he was beaten. Why? They're marked. Why? I don't know why. They're not allowed to live among us. In the old days, they sometimes served as a sacrifice at the hail. They are filthy people. They don't look any different. That is why they are marked, so people may know them. I don't understand why. I don't know why. They are just no better than animals. Many of them try to pretend that they don't belong to the Hua. Some of them try to give their children away so that their babies will grow up unrecognized. I knew a girl who had a baby by a Hua once. If that happened to me, I would kill it. How disgusting. They're disgusting. That is how their blood is hated. Oh, I don't wish to hear this talk. Please, we must go. We have work to do. He was old, somewhat, he had a limp, a bad leg. Was he killed? No, he managed to get away. Oh. Do you know who this person is? Aloha! Oh, we stopped them to look at the Mikanelli. Oh, what are they doing? 
running around, taking off dirt. <laughs> they always do that. I don't know why they want them. someone else to do the work for them. <laughs> Perhaps it is Kapu and Amerika. No, it isn't. <laughs> How do you know? Davis told me oh. once, a long time ago. What? What was his sickness? I don't know. My father said he died of too much rum. You must be <sighs> lonely for him. You have a very kind heart, honey. Not very. He was never mean to me. But he always smelled of rum. It was my father who made me go with him for a date. He was as old as my father. That is not what I would like. <laughs> well, I hear that other eyes are turned your way, Hannah Grimes. Well, Hannah, tell me. <laughs> a younger man whose body speaks for itself when Hannah is near. Hannah, tell me who. That you go with the younger man. That way, the canoe will fit the halal. <laughs> <laughs> Myself, I prefer someone closer to my age, too. I like the way he touches me. <sighs> and he does not smell of rum. He likes to laugh. Well, Jones is better to look at than David. Is it Jones? The Howlet? The American Consul? <laughs> yes, you fucking head. Many women <laughs> desire him. <laughs> I. But it is Hannah who he desires. <laughs> oh, well, uh, when will you find a mate for such things, Hannah? A pie, tell a wife. I don't want one right now. Maybe later. Maybe you've never been with a man? Maybe. Why? Because I haven't found one I wanted. Or one who wanted you. Hana, Polly has her own wisdom. Besides, it's not good to be with a man you don't want. Hmm. Go tell them, Canelli. They may join us at cards. Come, oh, Madam says you may join our game if you wish. I'm sorry, we can't play. Well, I will show you. I'm very good. I want a Spanish dollar from a sailor this morning. American ladies do not play cards. You must wait then. Oh, well, they said American ladies may not play cards. What? Hmm. Aloha, Eno. No wonder they never look happy. What is the pleasure in their lives? Uh, many say the men of the Mikanele only brought these women to be cooks and cabin boys for them. They should learn to throw up their terrible kapu like we did. Sybil, come here. I, I want to tell you something. Tell me what? I feel something. You, what is it, Lucy? I found something. It's, it's, it's what, Lucy? Yes? Nothing. It's nothing. I'm so silly. <laughs> Are you I'm sure? Fine. Haven't they finished yet? Not yet. Well, this is very rude. It's only rude to us, who think it rude to keep people waiting. It is rude to keep people waiting. She is used to doing as she pleases. It's her heathen manners. They are almost finished. Then you will be called. Thank you. A 
again. There. That is your name. That is very quick of you, Hannah. Hers is better than mine. Sh help guide my hand. K A A H U M A N U. Hmm. Ahana, put put away the cards. We will do this now. Well, perhaps I could come tomorrow and begin a lesson. No, not tomorrow. Now. Many times. I have watched the ship sail in and out of the port of Honolulu, and many times I have wondered, who made this great world? Why are people different? Why are there different ways of talking? What does the world look like away from here, far away? These women of the Mikinelli are the first women of my father's people I have ever seen. They are very different. They work all the time, and do not seem to care very much for play or laughter. But there is a way they do things which I like. There is a place for everything in their houses. It is clean and quiet. There is a fresh feeling. It is a feeling of peace. Without the yelling of drunken men and the smell of rum. There is a gentle kindness about Mrs. Bingham. And they know how to read and write. To know the Palapala is to know many things. Their talk is of a kind God, Jesus, a God to whom women may speak, and a God who will let us in his temple. We see more of them every day. She cried to me, Sybil, begged me for medicine to make her well, and I told her to go away. There is no medicine. Sometimes I feel as if I couldn't stand to see another face like that, as if I won't be able to stand to see another face in pain. This is the gift of men who call themselves Christian and have no idea what the true meaning of that word is. Men come to these islands for their pleasure, without the love of Jesus in their hearts. They are killing them, Lucy. They come for their pleasure and their lust. They are killing these people. They thought that Cook was a god. Perhaps he was their angel of death. Perhaps God is punishing these people for their sins of idolatry. We are all sinners, sister. Yes. It is our job to bring the word of light. Yes. And to minister to the needs of these people. But how can we? With so few doctors among us, how can we ever hope to stay the hand of death that every day tightens its grip on these people? Aloha, Your Majesty. Aloha. Please come in and be seated. How are you today? I am well. Shall we begin the lesson? Yes, let's read. I must ask. Yes. The sickness that so many women have from the sailors. You don't have this in America? Yes, but yes, we but well. You see, there are good women and there are bad women, and the good women do not do the things which spread the sickness. No? No. Well, how is it that they get children? Well, by getting married. Be no 
don't want to eat. This is not how you get children. What we need is that there is a... We think that something ought to be done to stop these women. They are spreading the disease. It is the holy men who brought this disease. Yes, but the women who are going to these ships, well, they're, they're making it worse. Uh, well, perhaps I shall make um, a couple on all the men and the women who have this disease. I don't they may only go with each other. No, I don't think that would be the proper way of going about such a... Well, I can mark them so oh, we will know. Perhaps it would be better to forbid the people from doing what they do if they are not married. Why? Well, it is a sin. You don't like it? Certainly not. We, we feel it is only for those who are men. So they may have children. <laughs> You don't do it for the sheer pleasure of it? No! no. <laughs> oh, 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 what do you women have to keep you happy? We feel it is wrong to do without a Christian man. Why? God has said it in his holy commandments. Oh, him. If your people would follow these commandments, the, then the sickness would not spread through your people. God is the only refuge, uh, the only safe father. Well, perhaps I will think on these things. Perhaps it is a good thing, like the palapala is a good thing. Hmm. I will think on it. But I, have, I will have no more gods to make me a slave to their power. I will think on it. Now let us read. Very well. Hmm. Let us read. I will read this that I like. Where unto shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what shall we compare it? It is the grain of mustard. mustard seed, which when it is sown, it sown in the earth, it, it is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, it groweth up and becometh greater than all the herbs, and shooteth out great branches, so that all the birds of the air may lodge, lodge. lodge under the sh shadow. shadow of it. <laughs> Please, you will help me. What's the matter? I just put Charlotte in your cellar. Why should you put your sister in the cellar? Why does she have to hide? He stole her. My son of a bitch father got drunk again and stole her to Captain Willis of a whaling ship because he got drunk and lost her car. He said he couldn't pay right away. But Captain Willis just smiled and said, Sure you can. Give me Charlotte. I'll take her up north and bring her back to the ship as a belly full of oil. Oh I'll take good care of her. Just for me, no one else. My father just looked at him and laughed. He then told Charlotte that she must now go with this stranger for many months at sea. Charlotte is something the girl is a thing of. Hannah, she said. Hannah, what will he do with me? He's only 13. That son of a bitch bastard!
yes, a law to protect women and children. If this trouble comes to you or your sisters again, you must come here, Hannah. Reverend Bingham will stand up for any woman, you or any woman, who finds herself forced to such a thing. And so will Reverend Thurston, Hannah. Perhaps, perhaps we should pray for your father. Him? He needs your prayers. His heart is dark. He is no good. That is why he needs your prayers. Yes. Will you join us in our prayer? Hannah, please, lead us in prayer. Me? I. Please, Jesus, come to my father's sick heart. Make him well again. Make him see the bad things that he does to me and my sisters. How he hurts us and makes us suffer. Make him turn away from the evil things he does so that his soul may be saved from the plates of fires. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Why do you wish good things for a bad man? It is the Christian way. We feel that it is those who do bad things that most need our prayers, that with the help of God, they might change their ways. Perhaps I will think on these things. You will advise me. On these matters, you must speak with Reverend Bing. But I like your wisdom better. We are not suited to advise you about laws. But you told me about them. Yes, but we can't advise you about them. That would be politics. You see, as ladies, it is not a part of our sphere. The home is our world. We must not make laws. So, you, you will not make laws, but you will follow them? Yes, we will. to go. Come on, Hannah. Your sister will be safe here. And if anyone, anyone puts a hand on her, they'll face my wrath. Aloha. Aloha, Hannah. <gasps> what do you think of these things, Hannah? Laws and this marriage to only one man? I think it would have been good if there was a law that would keep Charlotte safe. Or a marriage that would have kept Jones from leaving you? You know? Perhaps. It's likely. Is he gone for good? Do we ever know if they're gone for good? He's gone to America? If I had been his Christian wife, he would have taken me. You wish to be as the holy women are with a man? Perhaps. Uh, Hannah, their men are gods, and their god is a man. Perhaps it is their love. It is easier to love a man than a god, Hannah. Hannah, I watched Kamehameha. I saw women bow down to him like a god. Do you know why he loved me? <laughs> because he knew I was powerful and did not fear him. Even my own father, King Yaomoku, told him there is only one person to fear in your kingdom. Only one person who can take away your power. Your own woman, Ka'ahumanu. For if she chose to rise up against you, the people love her so much that they would follow. So you see, I stood on the same mountain. I looked into the same valley. And when I saw him, I saw a man, not a god. And what did he see? Well, that would be for him to say. You don't like this idea of a Christian marriage? I don't care about it. In the old days, if a man and a woman desired each other, they joined. If that went away, they parted. But the old days go. And tomorrow comes with with more ships and, and more foreigners with their desires. Desire? Is that what rules us? I hardly 
suffering on my own. But these women of the Mignelle, they have shown me a new kind of desire, a longing to know the things in books and the world outside of here and the ways of God. You believe this God? Yes, because he is full of mercy. Uh, Hannah, he keeps a place of fires. That is for the wicked. And who is wicked? Those who don't believe. And those who do? Life everlasting, where everything is happiness and good. Uh, oh, oh, happiness and good. Those are things we need for this lifetime. This life is for tears and sorrow. Is this what they teach her? Or is she sad because of her lover? These islands are amidst a terrible storm blown every which way by the foreigners who come here. Laws. These women speak of laws. And perhaps some of their laws are good. In the old days, many of the laws were just foolish and unjust. But perhaps some of their laws are good. In the old days, if the people saw the Ali'i doing good things, they would continue to love us and follow. But I don't know. There's something I just can't trust about this Haole God. I know in the days of the Kapu, when our hearts were dark, we worshipped the hungry gods. The gods that were fed with plants, animals, and most terrible with human flesh. Men died that the gods might live. But now comes a time of light, a new god who is so full of love that he sent his son to die so that men might live. I don't see why you have to chide me for it. I'm not chiding you, you see. I was simply suggesting you that... You look down on me for it. I do not, Sister Thurston. Perhaps you think my feelings are not becoming of a minister's wife. I would never suggest that you weren't a good wife. As a missionary? Lucy, please, I am at fault for mentioning it. Well, I'm not like you, Mrs. Bingham. I have never been with my natural affection. I'm sure if you would just open your heart, unafraid, you would soon be able to let them in. I have tried, Sybil, I have. I have told myself that they are people, that they have immortal souls, and that I ought to love them as my neighbors at home. But I can't escape these feelings that come over me when I see them in their depravity. I can control the way I look before them, but I can't help the revulsion I feel. I can't stand to be touched by them, by those dark, dirty hands. And I hate the way I am stared at by those great dark eyes. I hate those eyes that stare at me like some animal. I even feel sickened if there's too many of them in here. Lucy, our work must be selfless. It's wicked, I know, but it's true, Sybil. I would change it if I could, but these feelings are beyond my control. I made a promise, a promise to God. I promised him that it would never make me falter in my work here in these islands. I can't love these people, but I will work. I will work to raise them to a state of Christian civilization. Suppose now you will think me a most unworthy person. No, I would never think such a thing. God gives us our trials, and we must bear. But I can't. But Lucy, what is wrong? I don't know how to tell you. I feel so ashamed. What is it? I found a hard thing. A lump in my breast. Have you told Dr. Judd? How can I? Where have you been, Hannah? In the house of the Mikunella night and day? Why don't you come too? I think they hate us. That's not true. I think it is. They're not good for us. Their teachings are false and evil. They don't allow you any of the joys of moving forward. Come, Hannah.
return to the way you were before. Be happy again. If they hated us, why would they come to teach us? I don't know. It's a trick. A trick? To make us miserable like them. They're not miserable. Soon your life will leave you, Han. You'll be just like them. No, Han. They teach me to know more about life. They make new pots in my head which weren't there before. And now, I may know many new and wonderful things. I have knowledge, and I will have more of it. Before, I was just some pretty thing that men wanted. But now, I have a new world of thoughts that is common to everyone but myself. These things you learn could be lies. They're not. I still sit and die! Okay. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> so the first half of, of the play is obviously the women just getting to know each other and learning about each other's cultures. And then the second half of the play, we'll see much more how, how they impact each other and the cultures begin to meld together. So it's, um, uh, a flashback for Desiree and I to look back at this footage again. Mm How -hmm. does it feel, Desiree? <laughs> oh, I feel that, you know, I, it was a great time. It was really a wonderful experience uh, working with those other actors and always so interesting to see what each person uh, brings to the role. So it was it was great. And can I can I ask a question? Yes. I was thinking, you know, as um, you know, with the opening, how you really nailed the um, the the attitudes and the behaviors of these New England women <laughs> who ended up, you know going as missionaries to Hawaii. And you're right that um, many of them ended up marrying someone simply because they did not, the, uh, you know, the uh, missionary society did not want to send men over as single men. They wanted them to be married because they were so afraid that they would, um, you know, fraternize, I guess. <laughs> Mm -hmm. with, uh, with the Hawaiian women. So they wanted to make sure. And the women also served as t teachers and, you know, things as, as an aid to their male uh, missionary husbands. But um, one of the things that kind of um, struck me was, I, you know, I was wondering um, about the mention of infanticide and also the mention of human sacrifice. I, I was thinking, considering the fact that um, from the time that Cook got there in 1779 until 1820, when the first missionaries came, almost half of the Hawaiian people had died from the different diseases that all the outsiders brought in. Mm -hmm. And I can't really imagine anyone um, purposely taking a life in those kinds of, you know, in that, in that situation where so many people were lost, you know, the, the people with the school children, you know, people of all ages, you know, so it, it you know, I was wondering and, and those kinds of things, by the way, the human sacrifice and the infanticide were the kinds of things that the missionaries reported, you know, to the outside world to say, you know, we really need to be doing this work because these people practice infanticide and these people practice human sacrifice. So I, you know, so I'm I'm kind of curious about your your inclusion of that. So um, uh, I'll I'll be I'll be speaking on behalf of the playwright who's not here today, but she did compress. Um, a lot of history into a short period of time for the purpose of telling the story. So 
it's not necessarily that infanticide or human sacrifice was happening in 1820, but but it did happen at some point in in the past history. Um, uh, and not not that infanticide was a common thing, but mm. but it did exist. Um, and yeah, human sacrifice I, I think maybe the infanticide could have been mis misunderstood because so many of the women did contract venereal diseases, which caused a lot of, you know, births that, you know, babies died or they were so ill that they died. And, you know, it seems like the missionaries were saying, oh, you know, they're killing their babies. And what, yeah, it, no, that's <laughs> children <laughs> are treasured in Hawaii. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, for me, as a Hawaiian woman, um, when I heard that before, that there was like um, mention or, you know, news of infanticide, I don't believe it. Honestly, I don't believe it. I, don't I think either. it has to do with racism. I think yeah. it has to do with their desire to show that they they were really needed and that it was a way to inflame you know, the, uh, the public back home who was supporting uh, financially these missions. Oh, yeah. I don't believe it at all. And um, because if you see the Hawaiian relationship to children, um, <laughs> it's not, uh, we have a, a tradition called Hanai, where you would um, like informally adopt a child. There was no unwanted child. And in fact, not only during that time, but my mother grew up uh, in, uh, was born in 1940 in a Hawaiian um, homestead community of Papakolea. Mm -hmm. And that is um, right on the um, rim or right in the area of Punchbowl Crater. Mm -hmm. And it was known that um, all of her life that people would bring babies up there and just like dump babies in that community because they knew that these babies would be loved and cared for. So a community that for generations and generations have accepted um, each other's children, um, have loved and nurtured without any idea of this one is not mine and that one is not mine. Um, I don't believe that in infanticide that they would just be killing babies for whatever uh, reason. I just absolutely reject that idea and would like to see um, somebody really prove it and um, see what they have to, you know, I would like to see more proof of that because with that in mind, it was also the time when um, the colonizers were specifically targeting um, Native people taking their um, skulls, digging up their bones, digging up their graves, and had no respect for them at all in any way um, that they were equally human and of equal or anywhere, even any kind of value to uh, the white uh, Europeans. So, um, yeah, I don't be, I don't, I don't accept that at all. And in regards to um, human sacrifice, that also makes a big headline too. But human sacrifice, um, the human sacrifice that was done was done under the religion of the god Ku, Ku Kailimoku. And it was done um, not just like every time, you know, it wasn't like a rampant thing. It was done specifically as the most ceremonial and like sacred offering you could give to a god. You would have to give the best, finest specimen um, of man that you could find. And if you didn't have somebody who was good enough per se, or you know, like a high-ranking chief or a beautiful man, then you would give something comparable uh, like in the animal world. So at that time you would give like your best pig or you would give uh, the best fish that you had. So it was a matter of recognizing something that was the top of the um, epitome for whatever it was and giving the best offering that you had to the gods. So yeah. it certainly, I'm sure, made terrific headlines um, with all the other racist headlines that they were making at the time. But um, 
no, I don't believe Hawaiians are practicing infanticide. And um, yeah. when the missionaries came and everybody started dying, a lot of the um, people, a lot of the children who were dying, as you mentioned, were dying because of being um, um, infected infected by those diseases that they had no natural immunities to. Yeah. And if you like take a trip to um, one of the older uh, cemeteries on Oahu, the church, uh, Kauai Ha'o church, mm -hmm. and you just kind of walk through the graveyard there, you'll be really surprised how many babies mm -hmm. um, died before their first year. And therefore, that's why we have still to this day, everybody has the baby luau, the big party for their baby at the first uh, anniversary of the first, well, the first year. And it stems from that, that so many children didn't make it uh, to one years old, that if they did, there was a huge um, cause for celebration. So anyway. David, I agree with you. Um, David Stannard has done a lot of work on infanticide, and he's he could not find one one piece of proof in any anything that he looked at, and he looked very thoroughly that that spoke to the you know a tradition of infanticide. It just didn't happen. It just didn't happen. Um, and Can by I the way, a lot of babies, some of the missionary babies died too. I mean, even Judd's oldest son died um, from some of the infectious diseases, so. Marina? Yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, first, thank you so much. I've been anticipating, you know, I was ready to go to the play last March, um, and then anticipating it to be part of our program and Island Feminisms, you know, the conference that was gonna happen. So I'm so happy and satisfied to have seen this part and was caught off guard that it was stopping. I was in for the rest of it. So <laughs> I, I look forward to it. And I also wanna thank you for allowing us um, to record this because I think um, it, you know, the audience for our website now that is growing and, and, and kind of transnational will really benefit. It's, you know, not only is it just great art, but I just see it as it's, it's gonna be a great teaching tool in, in, in my courses. Um, so, you know, many, many thanks. I did wanna ask um, to, to one question for you and, and for Desiree. So Desiree, one is, what did you do to get into character? I mean, what a character <laughs> you uh, took on and that was, and wow. And um, Justina, I wanted to ask you, did you think, you know, as a director in terms of how, you know, the, the play takes place in another time, it was written in the eighties and now we're in like 2020. So did how did you deal with all you know this sort of transition time so and i'll stop there Mahalo. a desiree answer first <laughs> okay um thank you very much um i think that for me i just really tried to do some um, additional research in whatever i could regarding um Ka'ahumanu and her time and I just thought to myself, I put myself in her shoes if I could, that this was a woman who knew who she was. She understood her power and she was smart and she was uh, smarter than all the guys in the room. And she understood um, that it, a lot was on her shoulders, that she had a lot of kuleana. And she also sometimes, I think some of her bravado was um, as we do these days, you put on, you know, your, uh, you put on your, uh, your outer skin uh, to be able to, um, you know, survive. And so I think that that was a way for her to sort of um, keep people away from her and to reinforce that she was, you know, for all, um, intents and purposes, the ruling chief of the time, the chiefess. So um, I also, my family will say that I am very bossy and <laughs> a lot of that is uh, comes natural to me. Um, but yes, yeah, so I do understand it. It's uh, a lot of it has to just do with um, creating 
um, what you want people to think about you. <laughs> well done. Thank you. So um, as far as looking at what was happening 200 years ago from through today's lens, um, I think that, you know, we, this is all pre-COVID, right? All the issues we were thinking about, COVID wasn't even a part of our imagination at that mm -hmm. time. So we were concerned with, you know, what impact has Christianity had on Hawaii over the last 200 years? What is the status of women now as compared to then? And mm -hmm. what are today's standards that we're judging Ka'ahumanu by? Because mm -hmm. for a lot of people, she bears the brunt for the bad that has happened in Hawaii and people mm -hmm. bring it down to it. If she didn't make that decision to convert mm -hmm. to Christianity, we would be in such a different place today. Yeah. But it's really, she was reacting. She was in a time and a place where she was surrounded by a lot of outside forces that were impacting her people and her islands. And she had to react with the tools she had available to her. Yeah, she had to make um, tough decisions. I think she was very strategic. Mm -hmm. um, I also think to myself that if I were in her shoes at the time, I would want a yellow dress too. <laughs> uh, I certainly, um, you know, not just as a leader, but as a female, you know, I would want, I, I would want like she does uh, the yellow dress. I would want, I would try to figure out how to uh, manipulate them so that I could have what I wanted. I would want to have the power of the palapala or the reading and writing because she could see that there was power in that. Um, so I certainly um, felt as we started to uh, really get into the play that I understood her more so and um, that, yeah, a lot of people blame her. A lot of this newer generation now blames mm -hmm. her for if she didn't make that decision. But really, um, tough decisions have to be made by tough leaders. And she made a decision. She didn't just, you know, let it sort of, you know, slide by and not make a decision. So for me personally, I always respect someone who has the courage to make a tough decision uh, versus someone who just kind of deflects. So I'm on team Ka'ahumanu. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. you uh, your performance was really amazing. I really, really enjoyed this. I was wondering, as a Native Hawaiian woman, did this performance and this play make you reflect differently than you probably possibly had in the past about your own history and as well as the history of Hawaii? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, you know, at first, I also was leaning more towards, you know, sh uh, that she made a decision based on her own sort of greed or vanity. But really, I started to understand that it was a bigger thing. It was a desire to have the technology you know, of the day that she saw the new shiny technology that was equal to power. Um, and so uh, some of my very vocal, like activists, uh, native friends said uh, when they first heard I was gonna do the play, oh, I'm not coming to that because I don't wanna, I don't need to see what she did because she did enough. We know what she did. Um, so I just kind of laughed to myself and thought, well, you know what, come and see, come and have the conversation because the decisions that she made at that time are still incredibly relevant to us today. Mm -hmm. And um, it becomes a timeless kind of situation and how to, and how we deal with uh, different impacts and different waves of change that um, are a constant. So um, I, I'm hopeful um, that we're gonna get to 
uh, stage the play at some point. I think it's an incredibly important story for um, the people of Hawaii to see, uh, natives and non-natives alike. And um, I think it's really important for a lot of Hawaiians who are Christians, you know, also to see that it wasn't just a case of, oh, Christianity is so much better than Hawaiian religion. You know, there's a lot of mitigating factors, um, so much more than we, a lot of times people just think it's this or that, but um, oftentimes it comes down to so many more details and um, decisions that need to be made. So, Virginia. But don't you think that um, there was kind of a, a vacuum that was waiting to be filled by the time the missionaries came just right after the kapu was ended? And the reason why it was ended was because so many people had died and things were going so poorly that people were really thinking, you know, that everything is so out of balance that our belief system needs to change somewhat so we can get back to some kind of healthy, you know, life. I mean, 40%. I mean, that's almost half of the people dying in that 40 year period. And she, you know, and she may, may have th believed that, you know, let's give this Christianity thing a try. Um, Yustina, you wanna answer that? Um, so should we talk about the Battle of Kuomo'o? Yeah. Bit? Yeah. So um, Kamehameha, you all probably know, he, he worked to unite the islands under one person's leadership, his leadership. And then when he died, the, the, there were different factions of the Ali'i who had different opinions on, on power and religion and all of that. And so the Battle of Kuomo'o was fought and it's depicted as the battle between the old and the new, right? Um, and the new one, um, and, but there, yeah, like you said, it was kind of a vacuum because there, the new was dominated by Western sailors who, yeah. who were lawless, absolutely ungovernable. And that was where Ka'ahumanu came into power and during a time when there was no way to control these Western men in her midst. <clears throat> and then when the Christi Christians came and they had this, this way of trying to not replace the kapu necessarily, but a, a different way that could perhaps govern the foreigners especially, but everybody who was seeing, well, yeah, the foreigners aren't getting in trouble, so mm -hmm. none of the laws work. Right. And the other thing is, one of the most important things is that um, Kamehameha was successful, you know, for, for a couple of reasons, but one of the most important ones is he had cannons. So he was given cannons and he mounted those cannons on his canoes and he used them and he was able to gain the advantage because he had that new technology. So that new technology, they also saw as, oh, it's, you know, the new technology that comes from the foreigners, that comes from their God is more powerful than our God. And so there was a lot to consider at the time. I think that that was very appealing you know, whatever team is winning, you want to be on the winning team. But the other thing is that Hawaiians were um, just blown away and smitten by reading and writing. And they really took to it um, uh, with incredibly high and quick literacy rates. So that whole thing of uh, being able to read and write and then being able to read um, the Bible and, and then being able to print newspapers and voice their opinions. Um, that was something that was incredibly attractive and powerful for Hawaiians. So all of that, I think that had more to do 
um, with the positives and wanting to have those, that sense of power, then it was um, then about people dying. Because I think um, the big, uh, a lot of people dying, they really blamed it on the foreigners, mm -hmm. you know, so there were some, you know, there was a negatives, but there were positives. But one thing for sure, it was a huge, a time of incredible change. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, decisions had to be made. Yeah. Well, I would love to continue this discussion because I cannot wait to, the, to, to watch the second part of the play. Uh, so let's come back on March 12th. I think it's March 12th. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. and, and continue this, this conversation. I think, uh, Desiree, if you can join us again, it will be great to have the playwright, the director, and the actress, right? One of the actresses. Uh, and, and so we can uh, have more information also uh, beyond the play. I'm very curious about the many women in, in the play uh, kind of critique. So <laughs> we will mm -hmm. hear more. And uh, thank you all for coming. Have a good evening, day, afternoon. Uh, and uh, it, it's been an honor to meet you, Desire and Justina. See you uh, in our second part of the presentation. Okay. My thank pleasure. You. Thank Mahalo. You. Thank you. Thank Mahalo. you, Justina. Mahalo. Mahalo. Mahalo.